All right, bang, bang. Today's Tuesday. It is uh, April 19th. Welcome to the Dog Walk presented by Barstool Sports here with Chief. Uh, Chief, how are you today? I'm doing great. Good. Have a nice Easter. Fatter than ever. Ate lots of food. Kind of relaxed. Yeah. Ref- wrestled with the nephews. It was a good time. Good time. Mm-hmm. Good time. Good Yourself? to hear that. Yeah, it was nice. It was, it was, it was, it was a fine Easter. Good. Um, so what's up? What's going on today? Uh, we're, we're getting into colonialism and then just i've always been fascinated by like why north america had so much economic success compared to south america and i've always wondered that about like detroit for chicago or cleveland or chicago where you know what factors because you know if you look at it on the city level the last one like a couple of cities on the great lakes had some great times one city was able to sustain it become like one of these you know top 10 cities in the world and the other ones fell off completely so i've always like wondered what happened with those and i've always wanted somebody to do a case study and i always wondered about what happened with north versus south america you know a place that was had indigenous people european call um europeans colonized it And then now, and they had tremendous resources and a lot of similarities in a lot of ways to North America. Like why did North America have more success in South America? It never made any sense to me. And then Europeans in general, why did Europeans kind of dominate the last 500 years compared to Africa, Southeast Asia, North America, indigenous peoples, whatever. And I've always been like, why, why, why was that? And there turns out I, I met this guy at a Blackhawks game a few weeks ago, and he recommended this book called Guns, Germs and Steel by a guy named Jared Diamond. And he set off to f- kind of answer that question. And so I've been air quotes reading it, audio booking it. And uh, I thought it was really fascinating. So I wanted to kind of relay some of those points. And then I, I'm going to take it a little bit further and kind of explain what happened after colonialism. So after all the guns, germs, and steel were gone from North and South America, what, why couldn't, you know, Mexico, Argentina, all these places, Venezuela rise and become economic and world powers the way that the United States did. Um, and that's kind of interesting too. So I figured that would be a decent topic for today. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, and also I think if you listen to an audio book, you still read the book. I don't know. Right. Yeah, I think some people are sticklers about that. I I like I like audiobooks because you can do it while you're cooking dinner. You can do it while you're walking the dog. It's like extra like found time that you're able to listen. Same thing as a podcast. Yeah. So I kind of I do that on occasion. Um, versus if you have an actual hard copy book, you, you're limited to just sitting there and reading it. So I feel like I typically retain the information better when I s- sit there and read it. But I never have like the time or the patience to actually do that. Yeah, you're using your eyes and your ears, right? As opposed to just your ears, right? Yeah, yeah. So that makes sense. But yeah, so I'm glad you count it as a book. But I know other people are like, ah, you really? Read though? It. Is there is there people like that who are like? I think there's hardos like that. Yeah, but you're still you're consuming the information. You're consuming the information. Yeah. Yes, but so I think there I are would. book people. They're the people who keep the books on their shelves. Like, oh yeah, I read that. Yeah, I got nothing against book people. Yeah, me neither. Yeah. But I, unless the book people are like. Uh, unless if they're like, oh, you didn't read it. They look down like, their nose at you. But that's, you can't, like you could say, obviously, oh, the book was better, or the book was better than the movie. Mm-hmm. You can't say the uh, the paperback book was better than the audio book. Yeah. Because it's, right? so you, um, I don't unless think you like the narrator's voice is terrible. Yeah. That would, that would suck. But that's not the case with this one. So. No. Um, but yeah, so I thought it, I thought it was very interesting. And something I've always been like just curious about because yeah. that like this the guy recommended this this book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, just based on a conversation. I think I might have mentioned who this guy was, mm-hmm. um, but his like great grandfather was the president of Mexico at one point, and got assassinated. Okay, and that's kind of like you told me he was a fascinating dude. Oh, he's he's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Is he coming? Uh, is he we getting him in? I, he'll I, come in. Yeah. Yeah, he'll come in. I thought we talked yeah. about that before. He's asked me to like hang out and watch soccer before, so or since then. So I feel like he, we're going to be friends and we'll get him in here for a sit down. Okay. Yeah. That's uh that's very interesting. Yep. Are we going to do um like the Detroit Chicago one or is this more like uh Uh not today. Okay. Cuz I think I might want to I mean maybe you and I can do it. Do a full podcast on that. 
Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, if you, yeah. You know, and there's, you know, not to give out free ads to another podcast, but there's this podcast that are coming out of season three called Blowback. And they've done one on the, uh, it's like 10 part series. They did one on Iraq, uh, uh, one on uh, Cuba, and now they're going to do one on the Korean War. And uh, and it's really like they do a great job, and I would love to do a similar style. You should. Where it's episodes and not like every week, but it's like we have a season. So it gives you time to do the research and the writing and all that. You should. That'd yeah. be interesting. Um, before Harry, we... you want to produce it? I'm down. Okay. All right. Step one. Are you Harry? Or did he just strong arm you? I did. I strong armed him. <laughs> um, before we kick it off, though, uh, we got to talk about Roman Chief. Okay. Yeah, so whether you're looking for gains at the gym or a better experience in the bedroom, there's never any shame in showing up for yourself and your health. Uh, the folks at Roman um, Online Men's Health Company, they're changing the game with these Roman Swipes, the secret to longer-lasting sex. Roman Swipes are a clinically proven way to last longer in bed. They're effective, easy to use, and they're fast-acting, but they don't require a prescription. Roman can ship swipes to you in discreet, unmarked packaging, and each swipe packet is small enough to hide in your wallet for whenever you need it. They're super easy to use. Just take the swipe out of the packet, swipe it on, let it dry. You're good to go. That's it. Go to GetRoma.com slash DogWalk to get $10 off when you choose a monthly plan. That's GetRoma.com slash DogWalk. One more time, GetRoma.com slash DogWalk. Uh, go do it. You know, you can't change uh, your sex drive. You can't. It's not going to work. There's no way to uh, do it besides using this. Get on Roman. Way. Just get on Roman. GetRoma.com. Yep. They got a little bit of everything that you could ever want. They do. Um and if you're not checking them out by now, you, you're you're like your life is at least some percentage worse by not going to Roman. Yep, they can fix a, a lot of your issues. Give them a peek. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so where do we start with this? Well, I would say you got to go back to like the 1500s. Okay, so before the 1500s, there was no colonialism. There's no like inter-race uh, slavery exploitation people were were kind of just limited to their own area so there's a ton of wars you know like inside of england inside of europe uh inside of china but there wasn't like well we're going to go down to africa and conquer these people like that that just wasn't a thing until the 1500s and what happened uh one of the things that really happened that was a contributing factor to uh this kind of the, europe went through a scientific revolution starting in the 1500s and just before that, Gutenberg invented the printing press. So you had all these people like who were, they ha were more scientific minded as a, as a culture just because they started doing this. And then they also had an increase in literacy rate in the European continent just because they had this one guy created uh, the printing press. And they used kind of their scientific mindset and this ability to spread this message that Europeans were a superior race, okay? Because they're just like, well, look at all the stuff we have. And it's just really just not true, okay? So there's no like, because they would be like, oh, it's at a biological level that Europeans are at a, at a are more advanced than these other cultures. Really what happened according, and especially, you know, J Jared Diamond really did the research in this book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, to lay out this argument and science, and like he used science and research to really prove like Europeans had a distinct advantage over other parts of the world uh, that allowed them to really flourish in ways that other cultures could not. And when I say flourish, I just mean like have innovations and technology and creating guns and steel basically and develop immunity to these germs. So. If you think about, I mean, it is just like dumb luck where your ancestors like ended up settling, you know, because if everybody came from Africa and, and migrated, that is, you know, the, the predominant theory that, yeah, like, you know, your grand, your great, 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 whatever settled in Italy, mine settled in Ireland and Sweden. And it's just like, okay, like that's just, you, know, you can't really help where you're from. But in those areas, they had distinct advantages when it came to becoming, um, agrarian like an agricultural society where it was relatively dry but not too dry so they were able and they had these crops that were that would work so like they say the cradle of civilization was it's really the, it's not just europe it's really this they call it eurasia right because it's all kind of connected europe middle east asia it's all like kind of one thing so you had the cradle of civilization that was on the mediterranean and in between the tigris and in iraq and then that spread out to Turkey 
and Egypt and all these places. And what do they have more than anything else? They have, they came up with agriculture and they were able to plant these, uh, crops, barley, wheat, uh, barley and wheat, basically that you could grow for long growing periods. You can feed lots of people by making bread and other things. And it was dry. So if you were to store it, you know, over winter for a prolonged period of time, it wouldn't spoil. Like if you bring a bunch of barley and wheat into, you know, and they had land that was easy to clear too, to, to make those farms where if, if you're in the jungles of Latin America, you're not really going to, uh, or, or, or Africa though. And you bring in these crops, those will spoil. They'll get mold. They'll, you, you won't be able to keep them for a prolonged and store them for a prolonged period of time. They just, cause the climate is too damp and wet to allow that. So people in Europe and then Eurasia were able to like develop agriculture and then like store those, uh, crops. So what comes from that is that you don't have to spend all your time just trying not to die, which is kind of what hunter gatherers and people were forever. Just fuck, just, just get to tomorrow. Yeah. Where if you're, <laughs> you're not having time to think about how to make a printing press, if printing you're, uh, press, if yeah. you got to worry about right. fucking, or you think eating. about like the Greeks, you know, where they're sitting around doing <clears throat> philosophy and then a lot of that stuff is like what took root in Europe and eventually America is like the precursors to modern democracies. Like they were able to sit around and think of shit because they weren't hungry. Okay. And they weren't cold cause they had, you know, figured out how to like store energy and fire and how they weren't, you know, Romans had like these aquifers. They were able to take water from the mountains and basically build a structure and bring it right into Rome. So they had running water in Rome, you know, thousands of years ago. It's crazy. And, be, and they were able to do that because they were able to have agriculture. The other thing that they were able to do, and this is just, a, you know, again, just luck. Okay in terms of being able to domesticate animals and certain animals are, you're able to domesticate and certain ones you're not. Europe has, you know, cows, goats, sheep, all these different animals, a total of 14 native, native animals to those, to that Eurasian continent were able to be domesticated. There are zero species able to be domesticated that are native to North America, zero. So if you're like some, you know, you're an Apache or whatever. You're not, you're not able to domesticate. There's no domesticated animals. It's because they're just not able to be domesticated. Some animals are more inclined to go through that process than others. So Europe had a distinct advantage where it's like, not only can we grow food, but we can take this thing. It's an ancient precursor to the cow called an oryx. And an oryx, you can just, you can fence in, same thing with sheep. You can, and you can make clothing out of that. They had all these animals that were ripe for domestication. So North America had zero, Africa has zero, South America has one, it's the llama. It's the only animal that they're you know, able to domesticate. Australia, zero, and Asia, you know, like Far East Asia had some too. And that's another advantage, okay, for, your, for the Eurasian continent. Eurasian continent goes east to west, right? Spreads out. So everybody's kind of in all the major populated areas for the most part are within the same kind of habitable zone where the climate is very similar. So if you're able to grow wheat in Iraq, Turkey, Egypt, Greece, you can probably just take that back to Spain, Portugal, France, Germany, and you're able to take these innovations in agriculture and spread it because the crops will grow there. It's like, hey, we're doing this over here. But if you are growing a crop in Venezuela, okay, I'm making, up, making this up, or Mexico, you're not going to be able to grow that at the bottom of uh, South America, or or if you're growing something you know, avocados, you're mm -hmm. not going to be able to take that up to Chicago and grow avocados because those continents. So if you're not you're not able to trade practices of agriculture between societies in North and South America because the climates v are crazy different up and down, where you can go all the way to China and all the way to t Spain and England. And you're going to have relatively similar climates all the way across. So you can say like, Hey, what are you doing with those cows over there? Well, we domesticate them. All right, I'll give you X and give me that cow. And we'll, we'll have cows and milk and cheese and stuff here. So you're able to feed your population. And then people are able to specialize in coming up with a printing press, coming up with, um, you know, 
architecture and how, you know different dwellings and things like that because they just have more time on their hands to be able to do these things. So that was like, again, it's just like pure dumb luck that they settled in a place and then they were able to have a lot of input cross-culturally to these different parts of the world because they're all in the same, I always get latitude and longitude mass, mixed up, but horizontally, east to west, same latitude, longitude, that they're, <laughs> all the climates are the same. So you're able to take uh, an innovation and a practice from one part of the world and bring it to the other and just continually trade ideas back and forth that it's like, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. And those opportunities just were not around like the Incas in Peru. They had nothing in common with the um, people in Brazil who were living in the rainforest because they're like, what are you what are they going to trade? Nothing, because there's nothing that the Incas can have and do that the people in the living in the Amazon would be able to take from them. And, and trade vice versa, because it just wouldn't work where they were living. So you had this idea of being able to trade things horizontally, like Europe really was able to take off. Hey, let's take a quick break here because I want to talk about the Game Time app. Baseball is back. That grilled onion smell, Chief. I know you love that. It is my favorite. Grilled onions on the grill, uh, having beers in the bleachers. It's back. Uh, Cubs and White Sox games, whatever you want to attend. The Game Time app is the only place to get the best, cheapest, last minute tickets. So uh, if you ever dreamed of sitting in a seat you never thought you could, behind home plate, first row in the outfield, catching dingers, it's all possible with the Game Time app. The biggest last minute price drops can be found on the seats you thought you could never buy. The best part, you get $20 off your first purchase. Download the Game Time app, go to the tab, the account tab to create a login and redeem code DOGWALK. For $20 off your first purchase, terms do apply. Um, $20 off is nice. I'm going to be doing that. So I move up to Southport, Wrigleyville area in a couple of weeks. I was just talking about how I can't wait until it's like 6 o'clock, you know, and you're like, it's a beautiful summer night in Chicago. And you're like, you know what? I'm going to the game tonight. Yeah. I'm going to pull up that game time app and walk right into a couple of reserve seats. It's going to be great. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, listen, Friday night, if you're trying to go to uh, game three, like the, the United Center is going to be buzzing. Make yep. sure you go check out the game time app to mm -hmm. get the uh, best prices. Uh, so, like you said, download game time, last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Go do it. All right, let's get back into the episode. Now, because they had those domesticated animals, there was the other thing, and this gets to the germs. So, with the germs... Most of these really terrible diseases, smallpox, influenza, uh, measles, they come primarily from living in close proximity to animals. So because Europeans had been living this way for hundreds and thousands of years with these domesticated animals around them, they developed some herd immunity to these things. So Europeans get, have a smallpox outbreak. It's not great but you're not gonna necessarily have the entire population wiped out. Where if you bring those animals and these diseases with you across the Atlantic Ocean, you're, and those people had never been exposed to those diseases, well, it's gonna have a drastically worse impact. And they say that when the conquistadors brought over, they, they initially came over, they, they did all sorts of horrible things, but they also unintentionally brought over these diseases and there are people who speculate that it was the disease in the 1500s from the Spaniards landing in, North, landing in the New World that killed 95% of the indigenous population. So wow. Unintentionally, because they, like, they're still trading, but, you know, but it's like, okay, this guy's got the measles. He goes up to the Apaches. The Apache goes to the Comanches. The Comanche goes to you know, the, the Pawnee, and it just kind of spreads like a virus does, like we've seen. And it just wipes out this population who had no immunity to it because they'd never been around a disease that came from a domesticated animal. That's uh, so, 95% a lot. It's a crazy number. Yeah. And like we, like we learn about the bubonic plague and things like that when we're in school. And it's like that's, you know, I think that, that killed, you know, millions and millions of people across Europe. But it was nothing compared to what happened in the New World once the Europeans brought those diseases with them unintentionally because they're just like, oh, like – so and so has got a flu, okay? Mm -hmm. Not that big of a deal. You got a runny nose, whatever, cough. You bring it to, you know, the capital of the Aztec Empire, and it wipes out everybody. So you had the, the technology uh, that came from being able to live in an agrarian society. You had, and because like people in, you know, 
indigenous people like the Aztecs and Mayans, they had great uh, architecture. They had metalworking. The only thing they didn't have uh, that really put them behind the eight ball was gunpowder. Okay. In the weaponry that was developed in China because they were able to, they were having so much, you had the Silk Road. Well, you were able to do all this sorts of different trades of ideas, goods, et cetera, that they were able to bring back a lot of these and trade a lot of these things that just did not happen in North and South America. So you had the, the innovation, you had the, the, uh, the animals you're able to domesticate, the immunity to disease, and those were a lot of the things that really helped Europeans have an unfair advantage in conquering the world and in addition to those, and who knows, like chicken or the egg situation, but it was be, because of those things that they had this air of superiority that they could then justify, well, they're a subspecies to us. So just fucking colonize them, put them to work or put them into slavery. And it was just like they, were, they thought they were justified in doing so because it's like, look how great we are. Yeah. But in reality, they were just born into like a better situation. situation yeah. yeah. So that was... That's like the the whole guns, germs, and steel um, background. So that goes back into like ancient, ancient history. And then some people ask like, well, then why didn't China, you know, because they're in part of this, you know, big long chain. Why didn't China become one of these dominant powers? Well, there's a couple different things. So Europe, even today, if you look at the continent of Europe, there's a million different countries, right? There's all these pockets of, you know, Estonia, Sweden, and Norway, and they're all a little bit different, but they're all very similar, but they have fierce competition. So it's like, we better develop the long bow. We better have the best horses. We better have, you know, the best metal working, all these different things because, well, Denmark's doing it and this kingdom is doing it and this, and, you know, they're always warring and fighting with each other. So you had almost like a societal natural selection going on inside of Europe where it's like, if we don't develop the best thing, we're going to get run over by our fucking neighbor. So they were always innovating, trying to come up with better weaponry, better, whatever. And the other thing China did is they, so they didn't really have that. They had these kind of more vast kingdoms uh, that were spread out and they didn't really ever, not ever. They still, they certainly had wars, but they did not have as the frequent wars because, and there wasn't this like just natural level of competition because they weren't at, they were just kind of a more stable, more peaceful society than what was going on in Europe at the time. And then China also, their emperor banned uh, ocean seafaring ships in the 1600s. So we've talked about this way back, like who really discovered America? Well, there's some evidence that China had sailed across the Pacific Ocean that they have like these certain types of anchors and they, you know, they were doing that well before the Europeans, but then they just say, Hey, we're out on ship going ship building and we're out on exploring. We're out on that 1600s. And that's really when the Europeans started doing it big time. And then they came over to central America and like took all their gold, took all their silver. And it's like, they subjugated these people. And that this is kind of where like the two ideas kind of, diverge because England in the 16, in the 1500s and before that they were having all sorts of like civil wars of their own. So they weren't really exploring. They weren't like that. There's a reason why Columbus went to the queen of Spain. They were stable. They were the biggest monarchy, most powerful country at the time. So they were the ones who were likely to fund such a, you know, an expedition where England like couldn't get out of their own way. And then the reason England ended up in North America is because that was all that was left. Everything else had been conquered by Spain and Portugal, like all of Brazil, that was Portugal. Really the rest of North America was Spanish. And then you can see that that's where the language barriers are. So we're like, ah, I guess we'll take fucking frozen Canada and New England and Eastern part of, you know, current day United States. That's what, that's what England got. And they, they got that because that's all that Spain had kind of left for them. That's it. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And Spain had this, they had these conquistadors. You know how they like got into power down there? No. So they, they, they would go to these different places and they would try to conquer these different people. And if they were like a normal, not normal, but if they were like a society that was more hunter gatherer, they couldn't conquer them because 
those people were typically more hostile towards the European people. Mm-hmm. And there was just like no system of governance anywhere. So you couldn't get like, couldn't rally like the native population into an idea because no, there was no one there to rally them. There's no like existing hierarchy. So they would find Aztecs, you know, all these with like a central more agrarian that had a social hierarchy, like a king already. And they would go in and they would marry into the ruling class like by force. So then it's like, well, actually we're the ruling class. So then they're able to subjugate all the people because they were already kind of living in that system anyways. These native people are already in the system. So they're like, well, so it's like, you know, this guy was having me, the king of, you know, the Aztecs was having me be a warrior. He was having me, you know, grow rice, crops, whatever. This guy's making me do backbreaking mining to get silver and gold out of these different mountains. But that's how they got in. And that's how they took. So they had the disease wipe out a lot of people. And then they were able to find these places that had this hierarchy of civil civilization. Fuck their way into the top, literally. And that the conquistadors became like this ruling class and they would exploit the native population. And the native population was like, well, he's their He's our king now. And because that was you know written into their culture that whoever was the king was descended down. So if they were descending down. The Span- the, now the Spaniards are at the top. The conquistadors are at the top just because they forced their way in. Mm-hmm. So either through trade or by force or whatever, but they got their way in and then just use what the natives were doing already against them, against their own, their population. So, and then that really, that rule did not, like, the English tried to do the same thing. Okay. So they tried when they got to Jamestown and they got to these, not, not really the pilgrims, but like the official Roanoke, Jamestown, they tried to do the same thing and it just wasn't working. So then they're like, let's have indentured servants from Europe. That didn't work. So they're like, how the fuck are we going to colonize these places? We can't make it work. You know what? Last ditch effort. Just tell anybody that wants to come over to America from England, you can own the land. Okay. You guys own the land and you'll pay a tax back to us, but you guys own it, operate it. So then people really took pride in their land. So in, in Latin America, the conquistadors, they liked, because they were the ruling elite, they liked their system of government. And there was enough of them that they were just like, yeah, we're fine with Spain ruling us. And we didn't care. They didn't care about democracy or anything because it was stable and they were rich and they were on top. They didn't want to change a fucking thing where the English could not get these settlements working because there wasn't like, they didn't have the gold in New England and other places, these precious metals. So they just, excuse me, they just ended up having to like have the crown just be like, if you want land, it's there, go take it. And then you cultivate it and pay a tax. So people took, like I said, took pride in that land. And then they also gave people like voting rights. So out of this colonization of, you know, but these English colonization came capitalism, democracy, Mm -hmm. and those things really never took root in Latin America. And as an example of how different it is, okay, Mexico between after they got their independence, so Cinco de Mayo is coming up in a couple of weeks. And after they got their independence you know, from France and uh, from Spain, they had from 1824 to 1867, they had 52 different presidents, okay? So it's all corruption. People are getting assassinated left and right, military coups. And as a result of that, There's no stable laws. There's no stable economy. There's no stable property rights. If you come up with a great idea for a printing press or a cotton gin or something revolutionary, and you would try to file a patent, there's no central government to enforce it. So there's just not like the drive to have innovation. So even though like agriculture has existed at this point for like 3000 years, people were still just trying to survive because it wasn't necessarily the winter that was going to kill them, but it was like their own, their neighbors. So it was just like, it was so corrupt and tense and violent compared to like the United States that were going through this, you know, they settled roughly the same time independence within 50 years or so. And we but the United States was just more stable because they had this inherent democracy and capitalism baked in because the, the Spanish plan, the English tried to enact, didn't work because they didn't have the resources, the precious metal resources in those lands that the Spaniards had. So 
that was like kind of this whole thing. And then you look at like the banking system. At the same time in 1914, the United States had 42,000 banks. Mexico had 42 total. Wow. Okay. And two of them controlled 60% of the money. So where the United States, it was, it was right before the United States brought in like central banking, or uh, maybe right after, but they were going through like you could just, you could have a stable economy. You could trust that your money was worth something and that you were, that you actually owned it where that was just not a thing across the rest of Latin America. And it's like, so it's like a combination of dumb luck. It's really all dumb luck. Okay. Like there's, there's definitely an alternate uh, scenario here where the Spanish version of colonization, like the English get it to work. And then our society is just exactly the same where it's presidential coups and corruption. Like we have corruption obviously here too, but immense where it just cripples your entire society in, in what is now America. That easily could have been us had they been able to get the Spanish plan. Cause they, England looked at what Spain did to Mexico and South America. It was like, fucking great idea, guys. Like <laughs> that worked great for, cause it enriched Spain beyond their wildest dreams with all the gold and silver and exploitation of the native people. England wanted to do the same playbook, couldn't make it work. So they had to enact this thing where they gave out rights to property and a vote to the people who were there. And that is really what set us up to have this in, in Canada, similarly, to have like our system of government and way of life where th it was baked into our culture, where it just was never baked in because it was all tyrannical dictators and landowners and conquistadors all the way back. Very lucky. Very lucky. Wow. It's kind of fascinating. It's super fascinating. Yeah, that it's was like, great. Yeah, it's like that butterfly effect where it's like one thing, you know, changes the outlook of history for like, it's been 500 years. And it's uh, the complex, the complexity, complexness. What's the, yeah. word, what's the right word there? Co the complex. I don't know. The complexness, whatever it is. Complexity. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Because uh, you're not even getting into like what's after that. You know, and what's now, like what yeah. class you're in and like mm -hmm. all that stuff. And right. Like, it still stands like I mean, that's to this even, day to a degree. That's even then what that one of these guys was saying that like if you look at uh, like Monterey, Mexico is like a very affluent city. It's up kind of towards the Texas border. And this guy would tell you, my new friend, that like the ruling class down there is still like very like you can tell they're from European conquistador uh, descent based on their complexion. And he doesn't really look like that. Okay. He's, he's darker somewhere along the line. Uh, there was mingling into, uh, with like the native population in, in his heritage. So like, they like look down on him because of like, Oh, you're not a real, you're like, there's so much racism yeah. even in Mexico. Okay. Where we think of, he's, he's like, we think of Mexicans looking a particular way. Mm -hmm where he's just like, well, we have like similarly and certain, especially in like the North of Mexico, the exact same looking, you know, white people, but they don't come to America cause they, they have it good. Okay. So, because they're still benefiting from the system that the conquistadors set up 500 years ago. That's wild. man. It's crazy. That's wild. It's crazy. So, so the I, English did the, did the English even realize like how lucky they were just given the the scope of the world and where we were located like how was that not a better selling point to the people at the time that's what's interesting well I mean th that goes back to the thing where they they probably would have preferred to go to South America and Mexico where they had all these you know these precious metal mineral yeah. resources but it was it's like if you try to go over into Mexico or Peru it's like, well, we don't want to have, have another war with Spain. Yeah. We'll just take this wooded area in the, in the east coast of the United States. Just be like, fuck it. Like that, we'll just take that and we'll see what we can do there. But I, and I don't, yeah, I don't think they probably saw themselves as lucky. They were probably like, fuck. And then, it, and then by the time, you know, and they weren't, because they weren't getting those, you know, gold and silver out of, out of those new places. So they were probably like, man, we've, you know, spent all this. We aren't, we're all we're getting is lumber. And then, but, and then by the time, you know, so then after what, a hundred years, America's like, fuck you guys were out. So they didn't really benefit financially 
at first the way that Spain did. So they probably were like, this sucks the whole the whole time. And then they started getting like tobacco and cotton and, and the lumber was actually a big thing for their Navy. And that's, you know, they used that lumber from North America to grow the British Empire to the point that they had that saying the sun never sets on the British Empire because they had Hawaii. They had these islands in the Pacific. They had, you know, uh, India. They had Australia. They had so like literally no matter what, it was always, always the sun was shining on the British Empire, Canada, wow. et cetera. So the, I think that they they probably like enjoyed it eventually. But initially they're just like, this is this is fucked. It's not working. It's so fascinating because it, it just goes from like, you know, like I said, the, the, how complex it gets with like, oh, well, now it gets in like a class thing and yep. everything. But like the fact of literally like like location wise where you are born. It, it's like you hit the lottery. That's like it's uh, a lot. It's a winning lottery ticket. I had this conversation with uh, a buddy of mine the other day. Um, it's. They just obviously saw the Masters, mm -hmm. and this is a totally different subject, but it applies. Okay? Yeah, you saw the Masters. Yep, Scotty Scheffler, uh, Matt Stafford, and Clayton Kershaw all went to the same. I did not high know Scheffler went to the same one. Yes. Okay. Uh huh. So they all went to the same high school, and like we're talking, we're going over it, like, and like how it's so advantageous for those Southern states. If yep. you're a golfer, like, mm -hmm. like how, like what's the, like, I've never, I'm not a huge golf guy, but like, what's the percentage of you got where percentage of people who've gone pro from Chicago versus Texas, you know, versus gotta, Texas, Florida, Arizona, it's gotta California. Be astronomical. I bet you it's the same for baseball. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you just have more reps. Everything. That's yep. why Texas football, like, is that why Texas football is so good? Florida football is awesome, too. Uh, and Yes, so, in California. And Chicago basketball is good. It's in a gym. Right. It's, it's indoor. It's controlled, yep. you know. Same so, thing in New York City. I don't know. That's just like. That's definitely a thing. Yes. And that's an example, like a, like a micro example of this, where it's like all the wealth accumulates because 5,000 years ago, someone decided to settle in Germany and France before they were even real places. And they were able to trade ideas with people in Turkey about agriculture relatively easily and bring that back. And then they're able to develop all the, and then, you know, a thousand years after that, you got the printing press. And then they were also, because it was th still easy. And that's like one of those things about you, the, the invasion of Ukraine, where it's like, it would be very hard to get from Germany to Russia without Ukraine because it, there's like this little narrow gap. Otherwise, it's all mountains. Okay. And mountains really separate people more than anything else where the Ukraine is flat. So you're able to kind of find these flat areas down through Ukraine and these places down into Turkey to trade these ideas. And it's east to west and like their ideas are applicable in your society and vice versa. So you're able to like grow and, and you know, two minds are better than one, three are better than two, six are better than four, you know. So like you're able to do that on a massive population cultural level in a way that was geographically not available to people in North and South America. It's crazy. And Africa. It's like crazy. what the fuck would a person in Algeria living, you know, riding a camel across the Saharan desert have in common with somebody from Nigeria? Nothing. Okay. Yeah. Cause it's like, Oh, you, you cook that food up there. Well, I live in the fucking jungle. I live in the Congo. It's just not going to be that like, you just cannot, there's no purpose of trading with those people. Yeah. Just the physical aspect is wild. Yeah. It's wild. crazy. Yeah. And, and that's all it is. It's just, it's just, we settled there that got, we got very lucky. <laughs> Crazy, and that dude. shaped history for the next, you know, for for the last five hundred years. It's crazy, yeah. Well, that was really, really interesting. What's the book again? So people, it's called it's by Jared Diamond is the author, and it's called Guns, Germs, and Steel. Okay. And then the, uh, the second half of that stuff, like post -col uh, colonization, um, yeah, I just found it on my own, just researching. So, Damn. Well, that's, yep. go check that out if you want to hear more because yeah, uh, that was really that was really fascinating. And it's not that long. So you, if, if you are interested. Quick book? Yeah, I would say relatively. Okay. I, mean, I mean, I did like two or three weeks. So Okay. Yeah. Go check it out. Um, all right, then. Everybody, thank you for listening. Chief, thank you as always. Mm -hmm. uh, that was great. Um, we'll see you guys tomorrow.